Coming up on Tech News Today, Qualcomm open sources the internet of everything. Microsoft won't be bringing back the start menu, not just the button. And Chromecast gets 10 new apps, including Real Player. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, December 10th, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by Shutterstock.com. With over 28 million high-quality stock photos, illustrations, vectors, and video clips, Shutterstock helps you take your creative projects to the next level. For 25% off your new account, go to Shutterstock.com and use offer code TNT1213. And by ProXPN. ProXPN is a virtual private network that allows you to use the Internet the way it should be, anonymously and without oversight. For 20% off your new account, go to ProXPN.com slash twit and use the code TNT. And by Ring Central. We do everything in the cloud. That's why we love our cloud-based phone system by Ring Central. Zero startup cost in Ring Central is $20 a month per user. Try it now with a 30-day risk-free trial. Buy one desk phone, get a second phone free, up to 20 phones. Call 800 543 9980 or visit ringcentral.com and use our promo code TWIT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zaktar. I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show that keeps you up to date on the most important stories in the world and gets you some perspective and some context on them. Starting with the top 10 stories of the day, the news fuse. The Linux Foundation announced the formation of an alliance. Uh, the all Seen Alliance, which is dedicated to building an open universal development framework for the Internet of Things, or they call it the Internet of Everything. all Seen will be built on Qualcomm's All Join technology, which allows devices to talk together regardless of whether they're using Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee, or some other protocol. Qualcomm, LG, Panasonic, Hayer, Silicon Image, and TP-Link are heading the initiative, and 17 other companies are community members. You know how Apple is always wanting you to enjoy free stuff? It's always just the company's like, free things for everybody. So Previously offered only in Canada and Europe, the 12 Days of Gifts app is now available to U.S. customers as well, where Apple hands out one free digital item for 12 days between December 26th and January 6th. Now, Apple won't say ahead of time what it offers until day of, but it covers music, apps, movies, things like that. The app is free, and for each daily offer, customers have 24 hours to download before it's replaced with the next day's gift. FireEye, a U.S. security firm, traced hacks of European foreign ministries to China. The attacks started in 2010 and are continuing. FireEye did not detail which ministries were targeted, but malware was sent to people working on G20 tasks. The hackers sent emails with attachments containing malware. FireEye says that nine computers were compromised. Chromecast support has just arrived on 10 new apps, including Real Player. Google has uh, uh, promised the uh, $35 video streaming stick will get apps in waves. This is the first one of them. Local file, file playback comes in various forms from Plex, that Real Player cloud app, and Avia. Other apps are a podcast app called Beyond Pod, uh, Washington Post Post TV Music Service, Songza, Red Bull TV, Discovery's Revision 3. Is there? You can watch Petopia, maybe. Uh, music video app, Vivo, and international TV service, Viki, are all available to stream to your Chromecast. The Pirate Bay moved to Caribbean Island San Martin this summer. You might remember that. But Torrent Freak reports that domain is already being seized by authorities at the behest of copyright holders. However, the Pirate Bay.ac is already up and running. That's Ascension Island. It's a little volcanic place you may not have heard of. But that's apparently only temporary as the company shifts to Peruvian registered, the Pirate Bay .pe, which is where at least for now it plans to operate for the long term. The group already has numerous other domain names in reserve, so we might be playing, hey, where's that domain from for a while now? CyanogenMod released a new screen recording app called Screencast in the Google Play beta channel. If you want to use the app, you're going to have to jump through a few hoops. First, your device has to be running CyanogenMod 11 nightly build. Then you have to join the CyanogenMod Google Plus community, and then you can join the beta program. CyanogenMod is also getting built-in tools to encrypt SMS and messaging based on the tech-secure protocol. Encrypted SMS comes in CM 
When Supersites Paul Th Therott, sorry, Paul, Paul Therott reports that Microsoft plans to bring the start menu back as an option in the next major Windows release, rumored to be codenamed Threshold. Microsoft brought the start button back in Windows 8.1. Mary Jo Foley on ZDNet reports Threshold will come in three flavors. Uh, there will be a modern consumer version built uh, for the, with just the tiled app screen, and that will replace Windows RT. Uh, possibly Windows Phone will get replaced by that as well. And then you'll get your traditional desktop version and your enterprise version. Nothing is official, but Foley says her sources say Threshold is due to arrive spring 2015. Developers of FreeBSD OS version 10.0 will no longer allow users to trust processors manufactured by Intel and Via Technologies as the only source of random numbers needed to generate cryptographic keys. Those are the things that are difficult to crack by government spies and other adversaries. Okay, so why is FreeBSD doing this? Well, secret documents leaked by former NSA subcontract Edward Snowden says that the U.S. spy agency is able to decode encrypted traffic. Publications like the New York Times, The Guardian, ProPublica, all report agencies like the NSA have defeated encryption technologies by working with chip makers to insert backdoors or cryptographic weaknesses in their products. Qualcomm announced Monday it will make a 64-bit smartphone chip. The Snapdragon 410 will also include LTE capability and be aimed at low-cost phones in markets like China starting in the second half of 2014. 64-bit and LTE will become standard across Qualcomm's products, they say. And don't forget Apple released its first smartphone with a 64-bit processor earlier this year. Intel has 64-bit mobile chips available as well. Facebook just hired NYU deep learning expert Yan Lankun, Lankun, excuse me, to head up its artificial intelligence lab. Now, Lankun developed a new machine learning method with AT&T and published a slew of technical papers on things like neural networks, pattern recognition, and handwriting recognition, just to name a few. Lankun will remain as NYU professor part-time while serving as the director of Facebook's AI lab. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Shutterstock.com. Com, the makers of some of the finest video and images you can use in your project ever created, including that wise, wise dog. Uh, you got to check it out. It's uh, it, If you're doing a website, you're doing a publication, you're doing a pamphlet, you're doing a video, any type of creative project, they have 28 million, more than 28 million high quality stock photos, illustrations, vectors, and video clips in there. They're adding 20,000 images a day. So every time you visit, you'll find something new. And they review each image individually for content and quality. You can choose the package that works for you, but once you buy an image, you've got the image. You've got it legally. You don't have to risk things. They have sophisticated search tools. They have those light boxes where you can save the images and collect some so you can choose or share that light box with other people that are working on the project. You can all collaborate on that. They have multilingual customer service in more than a dozen international countries and full-time customer support throughout the week. Uh, I... I have found many, many fine things on Shutterstock. I created an entire uh, book trailer for my for my novel on Shutterstock, just using images and videos that I found there. Uh, you can try Shutterstock today. Sign up for a free account, no credit card needed. Just start an account, begin using Shutterstock to help imagine what your next project could be like and save your favorite images to a light box to review later. Once you decide to purchase, use that offer code TNT1213 and new accounts will receive 25% off any package. That's Shutterstock.com for 25% off new accounts. Use offer code TNT1213. We thank Shutterstock for their support of Tech News Today. Joining us now to or kick around the stories and uh, get a little more insight into them is Justin Robert Young, host of NSFW Show and author of Go Home Santa. You're drunk. At GoHomeSanta.com. Yeah, well. GoHomeSanta.com is where you find it. Go Home Santa, you're drunk. A uh, bunch of short stories about Santa Claus. Thank you. It's perfectly seasonal. How did you, how did you time it? I mean, did you think <laughs> about that ahead of time? Yeah, you know, it just everything wound up coming together at the right time. It just bubbled up like a like a souffle. That's great. I call you souffle boy. Uh, <laughs> let's kick off this uh, discussion with the all the all father alliance, the all seen alliance. Uh, Linux Foundation announcing that dedicated to building that open source framework for the Internet of Things. Their their marketing pitch is it's the Internet of everything, uh, and they got some big names behind it. Qualcomm is the main mover, as I mentioned. They gave the all join code to the alliance. All join connects devices using different protocols. Qualcomm's been pushing that as a as an open platform, but one that they really emphasized works best on Qualcomm. 
and they really, I guess, weren't able to get a lot of uptake for it, so they've they've open sourced it. And all seen will be device, OS, and network agnostic. Qualcomm Senior Vice President Rob Chendokto told The Verge, we're at this place where people are trying to do everything vertically because they don't see another solution. And the alliance is saying, here's a big honking piece of functionality Qualcomm is willing to give away. And they're going to be showing that off at CES in January, including things like televisions from LG. Uh, this is, remember, we talked about smart things a few weeks back on Tech News Today, which is an open platform, but it's controlled by one company. This is an open source platform that is now distributed and, and, and run by a community. The idea being that your TV doesn't have to have the right phone to talk to, that everything can talk to everything else. Sounds legit. What their aim is, is and they've, they've said, a few people have said this, HTML did this for the internet. With HTML, it didn't matter what web browser you had, you could visit any website. They want to do that to the Internet of Things so that it doesn't matter what device you have. They can all talk to each other. Uh, do you think it, they can pull that off, Justin? Well, we are seeing, especially when it comes to devices, there is sort of a, a race to flatten out that kind of functionality. Right, you, that you want your, I think, as as the the Qualcomm CEO put it, uh, it makes no sense that your phone isn't talking to your your television, no matter what phone and what television you have. So, in the absence of something like a very, you know, let's say Apple as a manufacturer having their own television and having that functionality kind of be there in a seamless way, this seems like a good idea. The question is, as all standards, will it be adopted by the key players that move it forward? Well, even if it's adopted, the thing about education is the hard part. DLNA is kind of like this idea of where you're supposed to have your devices see each other pretty easily, assuming they're all on the same network, which is a, like a lot of a hurdle for lots of people. Like, yeah. I might have to network my TV to what now? But that's become a standard thing where people are like, yes, these devices are connected. DLNA had a big problem. It didn't really have a lot of marketing behind it. Sony would call it something else. Samsung has a different flavor. They call it all share. It's Apple uses a version of it for AirPlay. Mm -hmm. And it's in that education to the consumer. If this works, if this actually can have devices that see each other very easily, I would be I'd be surprised if each of these companies didn't call it something specifically different, causing confusion in the in the, in the marketplace. Because that's what we've seen. Other than like the closest thing I think maybe is Bluetooth as well. That's supposed to be really easy when this came out, and it was a mess for years before yeah. it finally became really simple. But wouldn't it be good for these companies to all agree on some sort of a term, and then they could focus their marketing efforts on we're the better, we're the best, you know, Bluetooth type of, you know, whatever name that's sort of ubiquitous with a certain kind of technology, rather than all having these what seems like proprietary solutions that aren't actually. But, like, the functionality has to work first before right. it's, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, adapted and marketed as, but we have the best this. Like, it has to seem, because right now, I mean, you look at Samsung's marketing is almost entirely predicated on, look at this feature we can do. You know, like, here's, you can wave your hand all over the thing, and it makes other things happen on your phone. And people, I think, have a hard time realizing, well, that might not work exactly the way I think it does, like, when I actually get the phone in my hand. But if this is something in the way that Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or, or something that was a standard that all of a sudden was rock solid enough when regular people interacted with it, then yeah, I think that this is something that you will benefit manufacturers and even big ones like Samsung and Apple if it is rock solid enough to build on. Sounds like what you guys are saying is avoid the mistake of Bluetooth, which I remember as far back as Comdex 1999. They were like, Bluetooth, man, it's going to be the thing. And then it was repeated at every CES after that. Yeah, Bluetooth next year, the Bluetooth this coming year. So it finally eventually did catch on, but it took forever. So so try not to get stuck in that mire where you take forever for your for your protocol to kick off. But at the same time, avoid the, the mistakes of Miracast uh, and have like 50 different names for the same thing so that nobody knows what, what it is when they look at the box. They Even though it might work with your machine, you don't know unless you do a little extra investigation. Um, I, I do think, you know, there's a funny reaction in the chat room, which is folks saying... Well, the NSA is going to get on this and the spying and the Skynet uh, side of this. And, of course, with every new technology, it's got to be secure. So that is definitely something to investigate as well as this thing gets off the ground. But the idea of making it easy for devices to communicate, I think, has the potential to be, frankly, awesome uh, and be a very, very good thing. 
Let's talk about Windows threshold. What, what's on? The, we're not even on the threshold. It's 2015, I guess. But what are we hearing? Yeah, today? the Let's threshold. That, that's been a, a code name, or at least rumored around code name for the next version of Windows. Paul Thoreau says he hasn't heard that name. But that's what people are calling this next version. But Mary Jo Foley's got a post about uh, Microsoft's next version of Windows. There could be three different SKUs, a modern consumer version, traditional PC, and an enterprise version. And that modern SKU would be the same version for Windows phones, ARM-based Windows tablets and PCs, phablets, and other kinds of tablets. Even some PCs could be running this kind of thing based on pretty much Windows RT or Windows Phone. This could be that giant merging of those two operating systems that's been rumored for some while now. Uh, there's also the traditional consumer SKU, which would be aimed at the current PC market. So if you use a keyboard and mouse, you'll be familiar with this, and you'd still be productive with the regular old operating system. And the traditional enterprise SKU, which has all the business stuff like uh, support for Win32 apps with a desktop environment, group policy, device management, that kind of thing. But Paul Thorat's got some more about the next version of Windows, saying you can run Metro apps on the desktop in a window. I know Windows on Windows is crazy. What? I know. <laughs> he also says that the start menu will be an option, although it might be only on product versions that support the desktop. So probably not an RT or whatever they're going to call that consumer version or modern version, excuse me. Jerry, what, what do you what do you make of this uh, these developments or at least these rumored developments? My two questions when it comes to anything Microsoft right now is that a in this time of transition for the company are these decisions being made in the what will eventually be the forward momentum of the new leadership or is it being made in absence of whatever the new leadership is and really whatever happens now is just going to be what this is and we it doesn't necessarily portend anything for the future. Uh, the second idea is we've seen Microsoft now, you know, it's like oh, the start button's coming back. We've seen this is the second time this year in the in the year 2013 that Microsoft, first with the Xbox, had these big kind of announcements. And then because of backlash to it, they went and remodified what their plans were in terms of the Xbox One's, uh, you know, uh, limitations on, on the games you were able to play. So I don't know. I mean, it, it just this to me. Very much, I think it's it's good news for Windows users. I think, by and large, this addresses some of the complaints that they had. But in terms of the general health of Microsoft as a company and Windows as a platform, I don't know if it necessarily says anything great for the larger narrative of either. I suspect we're seeing both the wake of Steven Sanofsky and the Balmerless future uh, negotiating these things. I, I, I really suspect that the the tile apps in a window and the return of the start menu is, well, sanofsky has gone, we won't get in trouble for giving people what they want anymore. But the sort of hilariousness of, hey, you know what Threshold <laughs> will have? A start menu and windowed apps does indicate like, well, there's really not anybody, it, it, there may not be anybody really pushing a, a vision at this point. And they're not not wrong it, because you're waiting for that new CEO, but they're just saying, okay, these are the safe things we know will be good to put into this thing. Yeah, Microsoft had that large reorganization where they they don't have like the same divisions anymore. There's the operating systems engineering group now, head by Terry Myerson, used to be the head of Windows Phone. It only makes a lot of it makes tons of sense for there to be one operating system where you have a vast library of apps. So then people who claim oh, Windows Phone doesn't have apps or Windows RT doesn't have apps, it's like. Yeah, it does. This the same operating system. There's no reason why they shouldn't run that way. And since they run on the same kernel as Windows 8, you still have more apps. So now they can have this claim of, look, everything you guys keep claiming, like, we don't have this application. We've got it. Uh, it's, it's in Microsoft's best interest to have a singular app ecosystem because that's obviously bleeding into Xbox like crazy. Mm -hmm. The claim is that Xbox has three operating systems in it already. So if, the, if they can somehow, and they've been very quiet, Microsoft's been very quiet about how and when you'll be able to have third-party applications on the Xbox uh, One as opposed to whatever they're going to give you right now. So this seems like it's that consolidation of RT and phone makes a lot of sense. As for bringing back the start menu, it's going to keep people on Windows. That's the real key here. It's, if you don't want people to get so irritated, they're like, I'm not even using this. I'm going to go to Chromebook because it has a menu. That's, yeah. that's a silly way to lose market share, especially since they've been so dominant for so long. Yeah, I, I do think that... Uh, there is a there's an indication here that we haven't given enough credit, which is the idea of Windows RT going away and a consolidated tablet, phone, and even apparently Intel 
uh, tile-oriented interface. If, if I'm reading this right, and again, these are, these are rumors from sources, and they're good sources because we trust Paul and Mary Jo, uh, but if I'm reading this right, it would be we're just going to have the tiled interface. We're not going to do this weird confusion like RT has now where you get a desktop, but you really can't do much more with it. That would be smart. And then a unification across the phone, the tablet, and, and the, the netbook or, or, or whatever you want to call the Surface uh, type thing I think that's really smart. I want to I want to say that if that's the direction they're going, I'm I'm curious to see if they can make it work because that makes sense to me. But I mean, like, are, are is this reading tea leaves that really won't matter when somebody else comes in? I guess that's that's my biggest question. Pop, you never well, yes, everything we're doing we're looking at now might or might not matter when somebody else comes in and changes everything or doesn't. Or keep, yeah, it's a good very good point, Justin. Let us talk about the wave of Chromecast apps. Sarah, did you surf them yet? Wave. Well, uh, I certainly have more options. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. Ever since the Chromecast launched back in July, there was a lot of uh, implications of, ooh, this could be really big. Local file playback was one of these features that was, was, was off-requested, and it's actually... Come to light, uh, Chromecast has a bunch of new partners. Um, so you now have local file playback for, as you mentioned, on um, the news view is Plex, Real Player Cloud, AVIA, which is little a, big VIA, other apps, um, Beyond Pod, Washington Post, Post TV. You mentioned Red Bull TV. I didn't know that that existed, but it's certainly <laughs> something that you can play on your big TV now via Chromecast, little streaming stick, uh, music video app Vivo, which actually is something I watch a lot of, uh, a content from Discovery Zero Vision 3. And, and they say this is really just the big wave of a first bunch of new partners, which is great because I think once people start thinking about the Chromecast as, oh, okay, this is a way that I can get content from my computer to my big TV or, or you know, from my, from my tablet, et cetera, um, and, and apps can, can build this functionality in. But then local playback, which is something that for a lot of people, for example, take Plex. Plex is a really great service, but for a lot of people, there's still a, okay, I need a Roku box, and then I'll be able to talk to my Plex software, and that's how I'll be able to watch uh, my content, you know, on, on a different device or on a larger device. With something like the Chromecast, again, 35 bucks. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's priced so well that, you know, you figure this is the first wave of, 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 of content partners all over the place. Justin, I mean, is there, is there, is there any reason that the Chromecast isn't worth it to you? Or are there certain features that you still think are killer features it doesn't have? Short of it being reported as haunted by an old pirate, no, <laughs> there's no reason why you should not buy a $35 Chromecast. Uh, and, and I think it is a it, it, it's a extraordinarily competent device for people who aren't necessarily techies or look at an Apple TV and a Roku and say, well, I don't know if I want to put in a hundred dollars worth of investment for this kind of entertainment. To me, the Chromecast and these kind of uh, features only enhance it is kind of the last word for me in the realm of plug-in devices like this, including Roku, including Apple TV, that we are now at a point where we need to see the device itself kind of completely flatten out the inputs. I think you guys were talking yesterday about, like, everything needs to get to input one, to HDMI one. And when that happens in a, in a really interesting and successful way, and right now we're seeing it, for video game players with, with Xbox One and what Microsoft is trying to do with that, but not everybody wants to spend that kind of money on what is primarily a video game device, uh, then we'll see an evolution beyond it. But for me, Chromecast has effectively shut down the idea of anybody else getting into a plug-in market because they have done it so extraordinar extraordinarily well. If you live in the Apple universe, though, there may not be a need for a Chromecast. Patrick Delahanty in the chat room just said that. He's like, I, I got rid of my Chromecast because Apple TV does everything I need. Uh, sure. But, so, but like, I mean, if, if you have more than one, I have an Apple TV and I love it, right? If I have more than one television, do I want to buy more than one Apple, one Apple TV? Or can I just buy a couple of $35 Chromecasts and, you know, pretty much have functionality like AirPlay? It's not going to be AirPlay because AirPlay, I think, is a better service, but something close enough for you know, three of them for a little over $100 instead of getting one more Apple TV for $100? I think this app development is a good sign, though. I mean, the, the fact is, when, when Chromecast came out, there was a couple things you could do with it, Netflix and, and uh, 
what was it, YouTube, right? So a couple of these things like, okay, I have it on my phone. I want to show it on the big screen. Seem like a really easy use case. As more and more applications support Chromecast, even if it's Android or if even iOS does support Chromecast, uh, I think YouTube does anyway. If these applications built in this, this functionality, once you start getting used to that button being there, then you start wondering, okay, can I use a Chromecast more often? Because at first I had a Chromecast for a while. I'm like, well, this is just kind of nifty when I want to send uh, a tab from my laptop over to the screen. But that's a very limited case to convince the general public, hey, th this is the device you should get. Yeah, it doesn't do anything on its own. You're going to yeah. need your phone. But the thing is we have this app catalog, another thing like still about apps. If they don't have the apps that can send content to it, the Chromecast doesn't do anything other than show you, the, I think, the time and the weather. Yeah. So you really need to have these applications. I think Plex is a good start with that. Uh, but bigger names like Vivo, that's a big deal because that's where people get their music, want to sh share with, with friends. That's the way to do it. Well, but all of these devices are Netflix, HBO Go, Amazon as an also ran, and then the poo-poo platter, right? Like this is all the rest of the items on the buffet of content providers and it's good that they have them better that they have them than not have them but i don't know how much of a draw it particularly is like the yeah plex plex is a, a bigger draw than maybe you're giving a credit for but i know what you're saying it's it's not massively popular either yeah i mean i don't think i just don't think it moves the needle necessarily i, I don't think that you can throw it that uh google's rushing to adapt their uh, commercials that run on sunday football so they can make sure that everybody knows that Plex is available on the Chromecast. And it's not really bringing you live television. It's not bringing you local channels directly uh, over the Chromecast. So that's a reason that we need another story coming up in just a second. But let's take a break and thank our sponsor <laughs> for today's show. You kind of use this too, ProXPN. ProXPN is a global virtual private network that works with almost any internet connection creating a secure encrypted tunnel through which all of your online data passes back and forth. Any online application can work with ProXPN. Your web browser, your email, your file sharing, your instant messaging program, ProXPN keeps everything you do online hidden from prying eyes, and they don't know where you are. they got servers all over the world. So you get complete online privacy through a 512-bit encryption tunnel. Uh, you can protect yourself against snooping ISPs, snooping governments. It's one of the things you can do to protect yourself. And it works with iOS or Android. Allows you to use your data plan or public corporate Wi-Fi with complete and total privacy on the go. Windows and Mac offer advanced controls. There's a ProXPN app for Android in the Google Play Store that supports OpenVPN. And they have world-class customer support. It really, especially if you're one of those folks who's out and about using Wi-Fi in public, you got to check it out. Go to ProXPN.com slash twit for more information and to sign up. ProXPN premium accounts are normally $9.95 a month or $74.95 for an entire year, but we've got a special offer. Use the code TNT to receive 20% off for the lifetime of your account. That's less than five bucks a month on the yearly plan. If you're not satisfied, you can cancel within seven days for a full refund. So go to proxpn.com slash twit and sign up with the code TNT. By the way, ProXPN accepts payments through Visa, PayPal, and now Bitcoin as well. We thank yeah. ProXPN for their support of tech Oof. news today. I knew Sarah would be excited about that. Hey, thank, thank you, ProXP. <laughs> All right, let's talk a little bit about Nimble TV, Iaz. Yeah, so Nimble TV is now open in uh, to the public in the New York City area. Now, the company sends you TV over the web with to your connected device, so you like an iPad or whatever you have connected to the internet. And here's how the tech works. Nimble TV sets up an account for you with a cable or satellite company. It then charges you an extra fee for delivery now, Nimble is also offering New York residents who already pay for TV with another service uh, access to streaming video for 4 bucks a month. Now, there's a, there's a bit of weirdness when it comes to Nimble TV's past. Now, Dish and Nimble TV had a dispute because apparently Dish was one of the companies <laughs> that they were using for, uh, for service uh, where Dish didn't like the Nimble TV suggested it had a formal relationship with the company. After reworking its website, Nimble TV removed all uh, mentions of Dish. Dish service still works now. On Nimble TV. Nimble TV doesn't mention how it gets its broadcast TV ch signal. So if you're on a satellite, you have to have a separate antenna. They didn't say if they're using the same kind of technology Aereo is. Um, Peter Kafka, All Things D, says he hasn't found a programmer that wants to say anything threatening about Nimble TV yet. So Justin, the question is pretty easy. How long before Nimble TV suffers a barrage of lawsuits? 
I don't know. I know that that's the reason why Dish doesn't want them to mention their name in any kind of official capacity. I imagine that that conversation went much the way that groundskeeper Willie uh, informed <laughs> Bart that it's the shinning, not the shining, that gives him <laughs> his visions. Uh, but I don't know. I mean, I think Dish obviously doesn't want to have any formal uh, association with them because then they would be liable for any lawsuits that get brought by the programmers. As far as I can see with Nimble TV, I think it's going to be a wait and see approach from from the programmers, just in the in the vein that everybody's still getting paid on this. It, it, it's it's uh, you know providing a service kind of more similar to something like a sling box than it is an, an Aereo, from what I can tell in 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 reading about it. But will it cross a line? We're obviously in a very delicate position, uh, you know, with shifting tectonic plates when it comes to where people get this kind of content. So I can't rule it out, but this doesn't seem to me as a stick in the eye the way that Diller is is very much trying to agitate uh, the programmers with Aereo. Essentially, it's, it's, uh, it's just a, renting out sling boxes. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, this, the, there are probably you're probably right about Dish and the lawsuit fear, but there are also other unrelated reasons Dish would not want them to be using their logo and using their name because people would then complain to Dish if they have a problem with Nimble TV. And Dish is True. like, you're not an authorized reseller. We're not going to support your customers either. So don't use our name in this because uh, otherwise Dish is actually fairly antagonistic with the hopper and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, they, they otherwise I don't think would complain too much. They're, they're risking those lawsuits themselves. And what they're doing with the dish is they're setting up a dish subscription in a data center somewhere. Uh, and they give you a New York address for that. So I can get this service and I can get all the New York channels. And I check this out. In the terms of service, it says you, uh, you agree to have us represent your address to be at our data center. All right. And that's how they get around the law and say, yes, it's a local address, local service, New York channels. Yeah. And I'm just and I'm just giving them an extension cord access. I'm essentially renting out a sling box. So that's how that main service works. But this add on service is the really interesting one for a little cheaper than Aereo. You can stream all of your local channels as long as you're already a customer. And I'm not sure how they're getting away with that because they say they're not using an Aereo system with micro antennas and an antenna assigned. They're saying but they're still saying they're legal because someone's already paying Time Warner. So I don't know if they're saying, well, they're paying Time Warner for the channels, so we, we, they have the right to view them remotely, because I'm not sure that's true. But what kind, of, what kind of agreement would they have with Time Warner? Because it doesn't make any sense as a consumer to pay more if I could just do an over-the-air antenna, I guess for the convenience, that's why Aereo is working, but if they're not doing what Aereo is doing, and Time Warner is getting paid, then what's exactly the problem here? Yeah, I guess uh, because they, they want you to—they want you to pay more. Eventually, they want to have the option to pay, to make you pay more to get the streaming version of the channels, and they can't do that if a third party is charging you, because they don't get any extra money. Especially because this is already coming down. You know, like it, Aereo said it at eight. Uh, you know, Nimble said half at four. So. Like the price of that kind of service is already at bargain basement level. So uh, who knows what they'll be able to charge going forward for something like this. Somebody in the chat room said, just too much turmoil. I'm going back to piracy. Uh, <laughs> see, the, the, the funny thing is like people just want to be able to watch their content on whatever device they have. And the TV Everywhere initiative that's existing in the current cable industry and satellite industry is not exactly something that you know, people like it's not something that is, is solving everybody's problems let's just say that you can't get any channel you want you can't get it unless you pay an exorbitant amount of money mm -hmm. you you can't stream things as they're happening unless you have your own setup at your own house so like the setup that exists right now is so far from what people want that if nimble tv does show up and they do any kind of level of success i don't see why the other other players don't bother to do this other than the fact they don't want to annoy their content partners and that's a constant argument here but i i could see dish quietly it's like shh not not us yes we want to mess with them but shh you know like like Paul, like like Tom mentioned about the hopper the same thing dish they they do anything okay, for market share they do it mm -hmm. they make the moves yeah. they're the ones who put out and they can say all right we are comfortable with doing this in a very strategic way and fighting these battles when they are putting that 
kind of faith in a proxy for whom they don't control. I think mm -hmm. even somebody who is trying to be logically antagonistic toward a system would get nervous. And I think the folks fighting Aereo want to win that lawsuit and then go after folks like Nimble TV. Because if they do win against Aereo, then they'll have even more ammunition uh, to be able to crush any kind of other competitors out. Yeah. Good luck on that, though. Well, I have always wanted to create my own Street View maps. Sarah, is there any hope have for me? You really? No. Is that no, something no. that you sat around thinking, if only I could Not also evil. contribute to Street View? <laughs> well, me either. It sounds but, intriguing, though, when I saw this today. Uh, yeah, I mean, Street View is great. In fact... Uh, I spent like, well, you know what? I'm not even going to talk about how much time I spend on Street View and weird uh, places because that's neither here nor there. But this is kind of cool if you want to actually start contributing to. Not, it's not sort. It's it's not Street View as as in oh me as a community. I'm going to just be like a Google engineer. But you can now upload images to Google's Views service and then select Photo Spheres. Uh, from your profile, that's actually, a, it's a service that Google allows you to do, which is sort of part social network where you we upload um, something that's a panoramic photo was either taken um, on your Android phone or you can use a DSLR as well and create something that looks just like Street View, acts exactly like it too. Um, the more visual and beautiful, the better we're actually looking at um, an example that was uh, put together by Evan Rappaport, who's the product manager for Google Maps and Photospheres. So what's neat is that you can either select a photosphere or use a tool to connect the map and the images together. Once you create a map, it can be embedded onto any web website, any application. It's just using the Google Maps API. So let's say you were a travel company and there was some sort of like cool art walking tour in Charleston, South Carolina, or you, I don't know, are a photographer and you wanted something um, that was very visual and interactive, you know, right on your splash page, you know, if people were looking you up online or something like that. Um, from the Street View site, shared photospheres will be visible to all users of Google Maps. They say they'll include the full name associated with your Google account. They link to your Google Plus profile. So this is all, you know, it's kind of, it, it is very much that Google Plus social network. Uh, location and date of your photo will also be displayed publicly. This, of course, is if, obviously if you opt in, if you want this to be the case. Um, and, of course, if you have a DSLR, which, of course, is a digital uh, single lens re reflex camera, which is a nicer camera if you're taking this stuff seriously, you can take a panorama from within your own camera software. I don't know. Let's say you have a Canon or something. They kind of all have them now. And then create a photosphere from there. Google's put together a nice, clean little upload page that makes it pretty easy to convert. So, you know, I, I think this is amazingly cool. And I'm trying to rack my brain to think, is there some sort of like, hey, Sarah Lane gives the best pizza walking crawl of San Francisco. <laughs> that would be kind of fun just to put together and put on my website. That's a little silly, but can we think of more practical purposes for, for individuals? Or is this more of like a business thing, Justin? Well, I think for, for Google, the more you were involved in Google products, the more you were involved in Google services, the more you are contributing to them, the more that they know about you, the more that they get free content. I think it's a win-win for them. I also very much enjoy that in the demonstration of this, it's of a grassy knoll and uh, mm -hmm. castle in Ireland and not like Cleveland, uh, which uh, makes me very, very happy that somebody got to go take awesome pictures at somewhere pretty for free uh, or for work. Uh, I think that this is a, it, it's an interesting idea. It's a good idea uh, for for Google to do, but I, I don't know if I can see a tremendous benefit for the end user. I mean, I mean the end user of somebody taking the pictures, not be, people who get better maps. See, I could see doing it because I know sometimes, like back when I was living in Manhattan and there'd be construction sites that would just pop up and changing everything. So the old street views, uh, pictures were just outdated. And so while you might be able to locate something, you might not be able to see it behind scaffolding and tons of construction. So that if you're the person who's actually updating it, who's just like, look, I don't want other people dealing with what I dealt with these days. I took some pictures of the photosphere. There it goes. And then people have it. Whether it means that, oh, yeah, IAS has the best pictures, I doubt that. More of the idea that you want people to have the data, kind of like uh, Waze, right? That uh, If somebody is a traffic jam, people talk about that socially. Why not this kind of this kind of way? But well, Waze does that painlessly. You know, you have to be citizen of Google Maps 
to want to correct, you know, mm-hmm. something that is wrong there. Uh, I, I don't. I don't know. Well, maybe that's the next step to make it painless to see what happens with the first bunch with the DSLR. You just hack into your Google Glass, and there you go. Uh, you know, as soon as they <laughs> track where you are, they they. Yeah. Just tell you, hey, look at this thing, or don't. They just make a sound, like a tweeting bird sound, and you turn to see what it oh, is. You know. you know that's what they're thinking, too, right? That's that, That's where their head's at with this. Next step for us is to get an email from Rich in lovely Cleveland, though, complaining about <laughs> Justin's analogy there. Um, <laughs> and maybe, me, dog. maybe for photographers, you know, to be able to show off, like, hey, here's my work. Like, it, again, that's another business use, I suppose. Hey, uh, I want to finish up with the Hour of Code. It's Computer Science Education Week. Hour of Code is a promotion run by Code.org, focusing on kids, but really talking about anybody, to learn an hour of code. They offer JavaScript, Android, iOS, a bunch of other languages at Code.org for you to just, if you've never tried before, take one hour and just get, a, get an idea of what coding is like. The President of the United States said, in their little video there. Don't just buy a new video game, make one. Don't just download the latest app, help design it. Don't just play on your phone, program it. Uh, and they got lots of stars. They've got Shakira, Buffy, Chris Bosh, Ashton Kutcher, Kenna, Bill Gates and Zuckerberg, of course. Uh, you know, the US economy is adding nearly 140,000 computing jobs every year, but Code.org says only 40,000 college students graduate with a computer science degree every year. Now, you may say, oh, I'm all in. This is great. You know, learn to code, promote it with the kids. And Philip Bump has an interesting perspective on this on thewire.com. He says, every American should know basic math. Every American should understand the logical underpinnings to coding, the way conditional clauses work, and the cyclical way in which systems are constructed. Americans should know that the way a website works isn't the way a video game works, which isn't the way a bank database works, but they don't need to learn to code all of those things. So, Justin, learn to code or not? Well, I, I see where uh, the, the the columnist on the wire was was coming from. I think he he has more of an issue with the tone in which this message was delivered by the president and the mythology around the general idea that goes beyond coding of learn the, the the trade of the era and you, sir, will have a fine life if you can, you know, fix a car or, you know, operate a telephone or something like that. Uh, and I think that he's right in that. It's like this isn't necessarily because he compares it by the end. I think his most interesting point is that you don't want to have it become like what everybody needs to go to college has become, which I think we are now seeing with like the mountainous, you know, student debt that maybe that's not the best general advice to give to every single uh, kid growing up. But as far as coding goes, yeah. I mean, I think will kids be better for understanding the basic parameters and maybe just even trying their hand at it so they have a, a better sense of how these sim uh, systems work? Absolutely. I have an eight-year-old little brother, and I am trying actively to kind of get him involved in just the basic ideas of what coding is. But... Is it necessarily the end-all, be-all? No. Yeah, I agree with you, Justin. I think I think it is really important that kids are interested in math, science, and engineering. That said, there are a lot of jobs in this world that aren't any of those things, and those are really important, too. It is it, because it's sort of like, okay, well, <laughs> I'd like to learn to code, too. Boy, would I like to make my own app and, and get rich. But the, well, we know that that doesn't necessarily happen. There are a lot of very talented people out there that are struggling to get noticed because there are just there are a lot of little programs that get written by people who know how to co how to code. So sure, learn how to code and strive to be the best. But if we're all doing that, then that doesn't fix the problem either. I mean, I guess if if maybe it's just because I live in Silicon Valley and so I know a lot of people who are programmers. But if I thought that there was some really big black hole where all the coders should be. You know, I'd say, yeah, we all need to get on that. But it's 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 almost as if science and engineering is being pushed to the point where it's 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 supposed to be made to sound like better than a lot of other professions. Well, I think the idea is for exposure, right? Like the thing is, not every kid who tries to learn to code is going to want to continue doing that. Nor will they be, maybe not, they won't be any good at it. And they go, well, that was fun. I'm not trying that anymore. I'm going to try my hand at being a mechanic or try to like grab a guitar or something or just do anything else. You know, the thing about having everybody give it a go as opposed to going. Wait, what's behind that little, you know, little jelly icon or that little thing? Okay, if I yeah. push this button, something magical happens. 
to just explain to kids and go, hey, look, there are actually people who do this. You could be that person if you wanted to. It's like when I found out that people made cartoons. I'm like, oh, that's a job? You yeah. can go do that? I think the exposure aspect is much larger than actually requiring kids. To, it's not like the president saying every kid learns the code. That's what's going to happen. That'd be a little nuts. But seeing people who might not have tried it before and they might have an interest in it could change people's lives. Well, I think the That's idea what is Philip Bump is, is, is reacting to is that what they're trying to do at code.org is if we go just go and lecture people about, you know, the importance of learning about uh, conditional clauses and the cyclical way in which systems are constructed, they won't do it. We need to have celebrities out there and the president of the United States saying, come on, it's easy, just an hour, learn to code. Not because, and they want everyone to code, but because of what I has to say in here, it exposes people to the idea of what coding is and it helps them to start to learn these things Philip Bump is talking about. But the issue is when you don't promote exactly what your goal is in the end because you just need to trick people into being interested, it starts to drift. The message starts to turn into, and everyone can be rich because there's so many jobs and, and you lose sight of, of what the actual main purpose is here. Well, I think the, the idea is, at least that, that I find it most beneficial, Everybody can benefit by a basic knowledge of coding. The mechanic can benefit from basic knowledge of coding. Chris Bosch can benefit from a basic knowledge of coding when he plays the Indiana Pacers tonight. I have no idea how that would be the case, but I'm sure it is. Uh, and that, I think, is, is an interesting, that, that's a good, interesting idea. Although the taken, uh, you know, we are, we're hearing now, take an hour to code. Uh, the the uh, NFL and, and many others have uh, had the Play 60 initiative. What are we doing with this hour? It's mixed messages, well-intentioned charities. Now, I'm telling you, uh, you guys, the pick and roll is just like a go-sub call. Uh, <laughs> so if we iterate, what are you talking about, Chris? All right, let's, let's Although, fire listen, to be fair, what, possi what possible problem could the president benefit by by having more people understanding how to code? There's literally no coding problem that has bedeviled this president. <laughs> right. Uh, I, why would he want coders? No yeah. idea. Let's fire up the randomizer. Wow, it is to the wire. 51% uh, saying late 60s internet brand transistor radio. This one was submitted by the monster of subreddit, Captain, Kick, Captain Kipper. Uh, and uh, it's, it's posted up on Boing Boing by Cory Doctorow on Monday. Mark Hill found an internet radio product from the 60s in a Dutch junk market. Uh, the Internet All Transistor Radio, model S1000. So everything's written in English, so this wasn't necessarily a Dutch product or meant to be a, a Dutch product necessarily. It has warranty service. It comes from Internet Radio Limited. So Internet Radio has, has predated the Internet. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's great. That's too bad it wasn't like in a Pandora's box or something. <laughs> it would just be so The buffering's better. a real pain, though. <laughs> Yeah, you can't you can't get any channels on it. Anymore. Yeah, it's apparently been buffering since 1952 or whenever it was first created. <laughs> It'll be fair. It's using real. Okay. Let's take a break and thank our other sponsor for today's show, Ring Central. Everything is cloudy. That's a good thing on the internet. That's well, as long as you're secure, as long as you're using a good service, and Ring Central is a good service. We love our cloud-based phone system by Ring Central. No startup cost. Ring Central is twenty dollars a month per user. You can try it right now with a 30-day risk-free trial and be just like Twit, running your desk phones over the internet. So you can get your voicemail and your email. You don't have to maintain PBX hardware. You can get your fax messages on your smartphone so you don't have to deal with faxes anymore. Ring Central also features call functioning uh, program, the order of devices that will ring when someone calls your number like your desk phone, then your smartphone. So if you're not at your desk, Rings your smartphone. You never miss an important business opportunity again. You can even choose the amount of rings before the call goes to the next device. It's all customizable. Ring Central offers all inclusive pricing as low as $20 a month per user. And you can start right now with a 30 day risk free trial. And I have a special offer for our listeners. When you buy one desk phone, you get a second phone free up to 20 phones. So call this number designated for our listeners 800 543 9980. That's 800 543 9980. Again, 800-543-9980. Or you can also go to ringcentral.com and use promo code TWIT. That's ringcentral.com, promo code TWIT. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. Hey, good stuff on the calendar, finally. 
Lots of birthdays. Happy birthday to the first computer programmer, Lady Lovelace, who was born in 1815. Pretty cool. Also, happy birthday to Doom. Remember Doom? Actually, there's quite quite a bit of uh, nostalgia talk on my Twitter stream about Doom. Uh, born yeah. in 1993, so not as old as Lady Lovelace. But Although Lady Lovelace being the first computer programmer sort of set the path for Doom to exist. Exactly. Without I mean, our Lady Lovelace, there would be no Doom. She would have loved Doom. She was. A, she would have <laughs> like ate it up. So. She would have yeah. BFG in all over the place. She would have <laughs> ate it up like a petty four. <laughs> At high tea. Uh, let's see if there's an email. Hopefully. Incoming message. There's a message from Kyle who says, on episode 890, yeah, I'm behind, you all had a discussion about a rumor that Instagram might be adding messaging. You seem to have a difficult time figuring out why Instagram needs private messaging. I have one reason. I personally use Instagram to post pictures of craft beer that I buy or drink. Completely by accident, Instagram became a useful tool for me when I trade beer with other people in different parts of the United States. I would feel more comfortable giving out my email to potential traders via a private message. That's just one scenario. Kyle using private messaging for good. I like this idea. Yeah, I, I like that. Okay. I, I, I'll say, I, I, I love how much the, and this has existed forever, like the trading culture, like, you know, tape trading and uh, has existed for, for, you know, decades and decades, but how much it's exploded with Reddit and Instagram and stuff like that. Like, I know so many of my friends that have these niche little communities that they get packages from friends with different versions of, you know, cigars, beer, you know, different spices, foods, like it's just, it's awesome. Well, that brings us to the end of the show today. Thank you everyone uh, for joining us. Thank you, Justin Robert Young. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very happy I was on. Uh, you showed that show. I, you man, we did. We did a lot. It was great. Uh, thank you for having me on. Uh, GoHomeSanta.com. You can get... Uh, a bunch of uh, a bunch of uh, fun short stories. Nine short stories about Santa Claus. They range. Some are funny. Some are uh, serious. But uh, you can get the audiobook and the ebook together for seven dollars ninety nine cents. If you buy it on the Amazon Kindle store, uh, do me a favor and uh, leave a review if you like it. If you don't like it, then just send me an angry email and ask for your yeah. money back. I'll probably give it to you. <laughs> Go try it out, man. Because uh, I I was. I like Justin. We're friends. I sure. wanted to like it. And so I expected to like it. I liked it a lot more than I expected to. And that, I'm, I'm not trying to damn it with faint praise. I was like, damn, this is really good. Uh, <laughs> you tried you know, to damn it good. with faint praise. <laughs> Go homesanta.com. You will not regret it. Yeah, the audio, if if uh, you're a listener to TNT and you listen to a lot of podcasts, the audiobook is fairly short and has a full jazz score. So it is it is kind of a... It's its own big audio production. I think you'll really like it. I believe that's an Andrew Allen. Andrew yeah. Allen, yeah. yeah. Uh, he did the cover uh, the album. of the Free Play album. Yeah, that's, Free Play and uh, and Smooth Federation, all the all the Star Trek jazz covers. Love myself some Andrew Allen. All right, don't forget, folks, open mic submissions coming up. Uh, the deadline is tomorrow, TNT at twit.tv with the subject line open mic. Uh, show records Friday, December 13th. That's this Friday at 2 p.m. Pacific time, 5 p.m. Eastern time for about an hour. If so you're going to be available on Friday, then email us by tomorrow, uh, and we'll be picking, again, we will not be picking most of you. We'll only be picking a, a few of you. We only have so much time. Uh, but we will be picking some folks from the from the chat realm to come on and and chat with us and, and talk about technology and what they love about it uh, as part one of our holiday specials. So get it in there. TNT at twit.tv, subject line, open mic. Don't forget, you can have a voice in what stories we cover at our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. Uh, I, I can never thank the moderators over there enough. Folks like TD Enterprises and Kill D and Tom Gerke uh, do a great job keeping that place running, keeping it up. You guys are the best. Email us, TNT at twit.tv. Call us, 260-TNT-SHOW. And don't forget about the website with all the show notes and everything at twit.tv slash TNT. We'll be back tomorrow. Danny Sullivan from Search Engine Land will be our guest. See you then.